the case. Once the monks of the Eastern and Western Zen halls in Master Nansen's temple were quarreling about a cat. Nansen held up the cat and said, You monks, if you can say a word, I will spare the cat. If you can't say anything, I will put it to the sword. No one could answer, so Nansen finally slew it. In the evening, when Joshu returned, Nansen told him what happened. Joshu thereupon took off his sandals, put them on his head, and walked off. Nansen said, If you had been there, I could have spared the cat. So, so as you know, we're a part of the Soto tradition, although we have this hybridization where we do koan study, which comes to us through Maizumi Roshi. But fundamentally, we are Soto. Soto, as it's practiced in many of the large centers in this country, as it's practiced in Japan, can be extraordinarily beautiful. Soto ritual is incredibly precise, detailed, ornate. And when that's executed well, it's very beautiful. Some of us have sat at places like that. Students spend many hours practicing, practicing how to hit the han, how to bow, how to, you know, enter the zendo, how to chant. <laughs> So that when the service happens, it's as near to perfection as possible. And I've heard, I've never been to Japan, but I've heard that the best that we do it in this country is slovenly <laughs> compared to how wonderfully, with what great precision and artistry these forms are practiced in Japan. And then there's us. Which is why I'm bringing this up today. Um, as with all things about Zen, there's several ways we can understand it. What's it teaching us? What's the importance of Zen? And I would ask you, are we practicing Zen to help us live our lives? Or are we living our lives to help us practice Zen? There's a real difference between those two things. And I believe it's the former. We're practicing Zen to help us live our lives. And I don't know about you, but in my life, things come at me willy-nilly. They often aren't planned, although I'd like to, or it doesn't mean I don't attempt to plan them. They can be surprising, they can be shocking, they can be wonderful. Here they come. And what do I have to do? I need to respond. And if I'm a Zen practitioner, I need to respond fully 
and openly in the moment, I need to act. So we have the monks here in the hall. Who knows what they were saying about the cat? Who knows what they were quarreling about? Does the cat have Buddha nature? I don't know. So why did Nasan pick up the cat and threaten to put it to the sword? Because what the whatever the monks were arguing about was bullshit. <laughs> It was irrelevant. It was some useless intellectual exercise. And Nansen wanted to get them out of their heads and into the reality of this moment. And so he took this extreme measure. He held up the cat. And not one was able to answer. <coughs> Why couldn't they answer? This monk over here was thinking, oh, if I say the wrong thing, teacher's going to think badly of me. And this one over here is thinking, oh, I really want to do the right thing because I want the favor of the teacher. And this one was saying, oh my God, if I say the wrong thing, the cat's going to die. And on and on and on and on. They were still stuck in their heads. They were unable to act. And so an important theme in Zen is being able to function aside from all the judging of right and wrong, good and bad. I'm a wonderful person. I'm a lousy person. I'm, you know, I'm perfect. I'm a screw up. All oh, doesn't matter. We have to act. If we see the child that's about to be hit by a car, do we sit there and think, let's see, should I start with my left foot or my right foot? You know, and there's all those people on the sidelines. What are they going to think of me? You know, are they going to applaud me? Or, you, know, you know, no, we respond, we react, we go and we grab the child out of the way of the car. Unhesitatingly, and, you know. Monks couldn't do that. So along comes Chow Cho. Beautiful Chow Cho, who, as you all know, was Nansen's successor. No, he didn't call him. He's Joshua in the Joshua, sense, the Japanese, yeah. the Japanese. Are they the same? He's the same One guy. The, same. The, the Joshua is the Japanese name and Chao Cho, the Chinese name. Um, and, and, you know, he comes and he hears this and what does he do? Puts his sandal on his head. Walked off. Well, if you don't know it, putting the sandal on a head in China was a symbol of mourning. Very simple. Morning. Uh, uh, you know, he's simple. He goes into mourning for the cat. He responds in the moment. Right there. In, in, in some traditions, in, in Rinzai Zen, in Korean Zen, the, your koan is not something that you read and study and sit with in advance. And you prepare to go into Daisan and present. You do it in the moment. You do it in the moment. The teacher, you come in, the teacher says, here's your koan today, and you must respond. Again, it's pulling us out of our head. It's pulling us out of this intellectual process. All this crap, all this judging that we constantly do. It's teaching us to react. So what I'm not saying that there isn't a place for really polished ceremonies, for really beautiful ceremonies. 
But what I am saying is there's also a place for our just jumping in and doing it. You guys did that this morning. You took the chance. You took the leap. In this context, I'm also reminded of the story, the, the Buddhist story of the strawberries. Strawberry, you all know that story, but I'll tell it quickly again. That's the tale in which there's a woman walking through the forest and suddenly a tiger appears and it starts to chase her. And she runs away, and as she runs away, she comes to the edge of a cliff. And she peers over the cliff. And there's another tiger circling below. But she also sees a root. And so she flings herself over the cliff, clinging to the root. And so she's hanging, suspended, the tiger above and the tiger below. She looks up, and there's a mouse gnawing at the root. And at that moment, she spies a strawberry. <coughs> she takes a taste. When she flung herself over that cliff, she didn't think, is this right, is this wrong, is this, that? you know. She reacted in that moment. And when she tasted that strawberry, <coughs> she was tasting the rich experience of immediacy, unmitigated by all of the crap that we carry around with us. To me, that's Zen. And that's something that you guys exhibited this morning with all of our flub ups and laughter and everything else. We were keeping it real. We were keeping it real. You know, sort of a, you know, Kathleen had. Many of you remember Kathleen. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of her interests was sort of the connection between Zen and improv. Mm -hmm. And that, because in improv, they have that same kind of an idea. You know, somebody throws you the line and you've got to respond. You don't get to think, you don't get to, you know, chug it around in your head. You just got to be there in the moment constantly. Well, the only thing that she missed is that. While improv is this thing that happens on the stage, life is improv. Life is improv. Stuff comes at us and we respond. That doesn't mean, yeah, there's time. Sometimes we have times we need to think, we need to plan, we need to, you know. That's completely appropriate in its context. But many times we just have life hitting us in the face. The cat is in front of us, it's about to be severed, and what do we do? What do we do? So, thank you all so much for your practice this morning. For that service. I, Dan said it. Steph and Margaret would have loved it, and I hope, <laughs> I hope that, you know, I don't understand how this universe is constructed, but maybe in some way they, they you know, they're, they're here, they're here, yeah. they know.